by. Mr. Euron Brook, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. It's good to be back, Robert. Glad to have you again. Uh, I think we will be continuing our journey today <clears throat> through Ayn Rand's essay, The Virtue of Selfishness. Mm-hmm. Um, and today, I think she, I think we're going to be getting into a bit of her discussion on ethics. Um, so per usual, I'll just start out reading an excerpt here to get us rolling and we'll see sure. where it goes. Sure. So I'm on, uh, on page 17 of the PDF, uh, and we'll, we'll link this in the show notes as well. If anyone who wants to follow along, Rand writes, psychologically, the choice to think not is the choice to focus or not existentially the choice to focus or not is the choice to be conscious or not metaphysically the choice to be conscious or not is the choice of life or death and she goes on to write that that which his survival requires is set by his nature and is not open to his choice what is open to his choice is only whether he will discover it or not whether he will choose the right goals and values or not he is free to make the wrong choice but not free to succeed with it. He is free to (laughs) evade reality. He is free to unfocus his mind and stumble blindly down any road he pleases, but not free to avoid the abyss he refuses to see. So, you know, she's obviously putting the primacy on choice here, saying, you know, making the the point that I guess we're, we're free to choose our own means and ends. But if we choose improper means, then we will not necessarily get to the desired ends, uh, in particular, referring to reason and or ethics here. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, she's really, uh, you know, arguing here that there's one fundamental choice that all other choices are derivative. But really, there's one fundamental choice. uh, There's one core to the whole idea of free will, and that is. Do you choose to think or not to think? Do you choose to focus your mind or not? Do you choose to be conscious, i.e. of your environment and of your own mental activity? Or do you choose to not uh, be conscious of it? And once you make that choice, once you make the choice to focus, everything else, uh, you know, leads from that. Because once you're engaged with reason, once you're focused, once you're conscious, uh, then now you know you now you, what does consciousness do it's it's integrating the facts of reality you're thinking you're doing the work that's necessary for human survival she's also staying here so that's one is kind of it's a unique perspective on free will free will is not about am i flicking up my finger now and am, am i doing that because i chose to do it or whatever um you know like the experiment uh, there's a bunch of experiments around these things free will is the fundamental choice that you make in some sense, every morning when you get up, but in some sense, every every minute that at least you're, you're engaged with the world to think or not to think. So if you think about Hamlet's to be or not to be, she's arguing fundamentally that is to think or not to think. And and if we if we want to live a good life, we have to think. And, and that's the second point she makes. The second point she's making here is human beings have a specific nature. And that nature requires specific action in order for the human being to be successful. So think about, it's like in nutrition, we have a particular, you know, biology and certain foods are good for us, certain foods are poison. And it's sometimes hard to tell, you know, we know nutrition is a pretty, pretty uh, dismal, dismal field sometimes, but we know that some food is probably good and some food definitely is poison. The same thing she's saying about, um, human life uh, in a more spiritual sense, in a, in a more um, integrated sense, mind and body. Some things are poison, some things are good for you. And the thing that A, allows you to differentiate between the two, and the thing that really guides you towards what's good for you is reason. And therefore, the choice to think, the choice to, to reason is the fundamental choice for life and to choose anything else above reason is a choice towards death towards poison yeah that makes sense to me that um 
I recently just did this series on uh, Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophy, and I was making this, one of the core points there is that reason, human reason has this ecstatic dimension to it, that it's always somewhat paradoxically trying to undermine itself. Like, you know, if you have, you use reason to figure something out, but the idea of figuring something out is so you can figure something better out, right? So this is kind of the, the process of civilization, the process of maturity at the individual scale, right? We're constantly learning and then um, reforming our, I guess, uh, lens or presuppositions about the world to, you know, improve, right? To become more civilized or more mature in the process. Well, to discover the truth, to discover the nature yes. of the world around us. And, and right. you know, I so mean, this, you... is, this is not exactly, this is different than Plato in a sense that for Rand, reason is very much tied to reality. It's to this world. Plato, reason is always tied to another dimension, another world. Because for him, there's a world of forms which we cannot observe directly in which reason connects us to that world of forms. Rand rejects that. There is no world of forms. What reason is tying us to is, is the reality in front of us, is the world uh, that's out there, and it gives us the tool to understand it, to know it, and then to know how to deal with it. And yes, it's a constant process of improvement because constantly we get new data, we learn new things, we, we build microscopes, we build telescopes, we, we, we develop the tools to, to, to refine our knowledge of reality over time makes sense the i guess the question i would have here though is if reason is that which properly couples us to reality who is the arbiter of whether whether we are being reasonable or not in any given action you know you use the example of nutrition for instance and i agree there are objectively some foods that are good for the human body and some that are bad but there's also this you know element of subjectivity as well right some people i i don't do well with carbs for instance my partner can eat carbs all day long no problem so there's this little bit of uh, this individual element to the consumer as well is that similar to reason that one, you know one person could think a certain action is reasonable another person could say it's not like who who absolutely that? so so, uh, you know, for you, it would be unreasonable to eat carbs if you don't do well with carbs, right? And, and it, it, uh, for your partner, it, it, it's not an issue. So one of the, one of the uh, inputs that you need in order to decide what food is good is my biology. It's not just what the, the characteristics of the food. It's the interaction between the characteristics of my food and my biological nature as an individual human being. And we know that individual human beings have different, somewhat different um, uh, natures in a sense of how we process food and how we, some people are allergic to gluten, other people are not, things like that. We take that into account when deciding what food is appropriate. And that is true of other things, but there are certain principles, for example, that are true of all human beings. That is for all human beings, all adult human beings, Thinking is the way in which we survive. Thinking is the means, um, and, and that's not individualized, if you will. But it is true that the particular values, the particular things that turn out to be good for us or not good for us, will depend on who we are and what our specific nature happens to be. <clears throat> so so the, cho the core choice being to think or not to think what does not thinking look like? Is that the pure imitation that she talks about? Uh, I can't remember if it was earlier or later. Is is that what, what does not thinking look like? It looks like what most people do most of the time, I think. It's, <laughs> I mean, I think it's true. I think most people drift. Most people, are, um, you know, they're awake, but they're not engaged. They just go through life accepting what's around them. Or maybe... Maybe they engage, they turn it on, like the thinking, when they're at work, right? But as soon as they get home, they flop in front of the sofa, they put on something stupid on TV, they get a, a, a beer or whatever it is, a glass of wine or whatever, and they, they veg, right? And there's a reason why it's called vegging, because you're shutting down your mind. So, But, but some people, even at work, uh, they're not ambitious, they don't really care. Or they just they're good at following orders, or they're good at mimicking the co-worker, but they never engage. They're never 
on than ever pushing things forward. And I think it work most people somewhat engaged because they know in a sense their paycheck depends on it. But so many people go through life not really engaging when it comes to their life, their choices, and 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 the way they live their life. They do what their parents tell them. They do what they you know what society tells them. They do what their coworkers tell them. They don't actually think for themselves. They don't engage fully. And that would be uh, I'm just hypothesizing here, but I'm presumably you're going to be a bit more challenged at work. And that will activate your engagement to some extent. Whereas I, at home, you can it's easier to fall into a pattern of of not being challenged, so you can just veg. Yeah, that's part of it. I, I also think that it's it's there's a direct survival instead of motivation, right? You don't get the paycheck. How do you feed your kids? If you don't do anything at home, or if you don't think about politics, or you don't think about all these other things, the consequence are not direct right we all we all are suddenly awake and alert and focused when the tiger is right in front of us right um and we we plan strategies on how to get away or we we we, we keep, but if somebody tells us the tiger's a week away how you know so many people just just they can't think a week in, in, in they don't they don't engage right so so one guy will prepare and one guy will not. And, and uh, you know, you put you put somebody on a desert island, one guy's a Robinson Caruso, and another guy will just eat the coconuts and survive somehow. But the Robinson Caruso will thrive on the island, and the other guy will not. So um, people, this is, a, this is a fundamental choice that I think people make. And sadly, I think most people partially, because they're not, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a little kid, how many times, you know, you ask why and you're curious and you're engaged and you're, you're alert and you're focused and how many parents slap their kids down, right? Don't ask, stop asking, don't be obnoxious. Why do you want to know? Why do you have to know everything? Right. And so some kids, the lesson they learned from that is, you know, being engaged, being focused, asking questions, not worthwhile. I'll just shut it down. It's, it's just not worth it. So Partially, it's education. Partially, it's some fundamental choice people make that's that's impossible to explain. Uh, but the fact is that we see so many adults out there who don't think for themselves, who don't, who are not really alive, not really engaged with being alive. Yeah, that's uh, actually kind of scary to think about if we're living in a world of mostly unengaged, unawake humans. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of negative consequences to that. Um, well, I mean, we've talked about, you know, there's so many, for example, economic truths that are pretty straightforward, right? We've talked about central banking and so on. This is not rocket science. Um, and, you know, right now people are living through inflation and they're living through and everybody's like, okay, there's inflation. It's not good. I don't like Joe Biden. Right. And, but there's no, thinking beyond that well what about the system what about the federal reserve what about other bouts of inflation how does this compare what causes it what are the relationships some people engage in that thought and some engage in the thought and come to the wrong conclusion right but very few engage in the thought right most people just okay it sucks to have inflation i hate joe biden today and that's the level at which they engage with it and they don't right. go anywhere else um, and that's the world in which we live. That's a world in which we live and where we're a Russian, you know, people can engage in war. Why would anybody ever want to go to war? I mean, it's lose, lose, right? Nobody wins in a war. Uh, and, 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 and you see, you see so much human behavior out there that when you sit back and look at it, it just doesn't make any sense. If people actually want to live good lives, they shouldn't be doing this. And the only explanation is, they're just not thinking. They, they're just not engaged. They're just not aware. They're just drifting along or following the leader. Is there some element of purposeful misdirection as well? As, even those, say you're an individual that chooses to engage in reason, you want to actually think about what's going on. I mean, for instance, this show, right? What is money? You could go research a lot about money and i don't think you're going to get to central banking often i mean there's a lot of 
misdirection, misinformation out there. So even those that choose to activate, choose to think, it seems like there's another cohort of people that are choosing to think to mislead the first cohort. So it's sort of doubly difficult, right? Yeah, there certainly is a group of people who either know or more accurately, I think, should know that what they're what they're advocating for is a lie what they're advocating for is a deception and they continue to do it and and uh, i would put many if not most academics um in that category uh you know probably most of them are in the category of misleading and it's not that they hold see it's very hard for a person to hold i'm a liar i'm a cheat i'm a crook i'm a bad guy people don't hold that they rationalize it and and they and they evade the fact that what they're doing is wrong. But I'd say most academics, most politicians um, uh, are, it's not that they have big conspiracies. It's just that they, you know, they've got a certain theory. They've got a certain academic, uh, I don't know, they've, they've published a bunch of stuff on the central bank. And uh, when you offer them kind of your perspective, they don't even want to hear it. They don't want to listen to it. They And, and they have a lot of incentive uh, because they, you know, they bought into this to spread misinformation, and they, yeah, yeah. So we we live in a world where there's misinformation everywhere, everywhere. Where you go to class and you study history today, you don't know if what they're telling you is is true. I mean, you have to cross reference and check. I mean, I often reading the newspapers, they will quote somebody and I'll go and listen to the actual talk from which they're quoting and they're quoting them out of context or they're not even quoting the right. They're changing words. They're actually deceiving. And, and you see that, you know, one of the tests of this is if you take a newspaper and you read an article about something, you know, what happens to me is I read it and I go, they don't know what they're talking about. And now I extrapolate to all the things I don't know, <laughs> all the subjects I don't know anything about. And my assumption is, that I can't trust any of it. And I don't, I, I try whenever, you know, cause I do a show and I talk about current events. I try to cross check, cross reference, find as many sources, try to figure out, try to get as deep as I can before I make a statement because I'm constantly worried that I've read something somewhere and it's just not true. And this is not the left or the right. This is the left and the right. This is, you know, everybody in politics today. And think about this. I mean, um, we might ultimately disagree about, about fundamentally about religion, but think about you know religious dogma for for thousands of years. I mean, if that's not a con game, I don't know what is. And it's a con game that they've sold. You know, you know, is is, is the glass of wine the blood of Jesus, or isn't it the blood of Jesus? Does it convert on the spot? What does it do? Is it a metaphor? Is it not? I mean, these are the kind of serious discussion. This is all a scam. It's a con game that pretty much everybody in Western civilization is bought into un, under the Catholics and the Protestants rebel. And, but, but there's a, there's a, there's a fundamental, what's the truth? How do we know what the truth is? What did God really want? What's really in the text? And how do we interpret the text? Who's the guy, our guide to the, the text. Do they want us to read the text, right? One of the ways in which Catholicism th- thrived was by not encouraging people to read the Bible. Indeed, most people couldn't read and what happened with the Protestant Revolution happened because the printing press came into being, and suddenly people were reading the Bible and they could tell for themselves what was written in there. And they were saying, what are these Catholics talking about? So we have been conned, in a sense, by the authorities from the beginning. We've always have been. And one of the things that happened in the Renaissance and the, to some extent the Reformation and then the Enlightenment is individuals started to question and say, but wait a minute, if I have a mind for myself, I need to figure these out things out for myself. I, I I can't depend on these authorities to tell me. <clears throat> yeah, a lot there. Um, there does seem to be this element of you know ideological possession, perhaps that we we a lot of these things we're describing, whether it's religion, whether it's your company, whether it's your nationality, like these are all forms of imaginary play right we're imagining these things these stories and then we're inhabiting these stories and so there seems to be and that first of all that's that's very indispensable for for humans to conquer the world right we need 
to organize ourselves flexibly in large numbers. We do that inside of these ideological structures, if you will. But there seems to be this, this age old struggle where to get in the position of controlling that ideology or shaping the ideology gives one so much power um, that you see people like, you know, a, a Marx, for instance, or any any ideologue, right? They can come into this position, support this ideology with full force, and they gain all this power over people. Um, so we seem kind of trapped in that because then they, you know, the people, the ideologue then starts to bend and twist the rules to their own advantage and it breaks down the structure over time. Um, and you said this earlier too with central banks, right? If you've been a, a PhD economist your entire career and you've been writing research papers on central banking, if someone comes to you and be like, hey, this is the biggest fraud in human history. Yeah. You have an incentive to be blind to that, right? You're like, no, the central bank pays me. I've studied it for years. I have, I'm in this echo chamber with all these other uh, I, members. I know and call that evading. I know and call that evading, and and she considered that the essence of sin, right? So the 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 essence of immorality was to evade the facts, to evade reality. Uh, you know, somebody presents you with a fact, and you go, no, I don't want to see that, right? I you know I I'd rather it didn't exist, so I'm going to just pretend it doesn't exist. That's that's what leads us down all the 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 bad outcomes. It always does. But with regard to ideology, the, the, the challenge with ideology is you have to evaluate it. I, ideology in and of itself is not bad, right? One could argue that your views about, about the, the evil of the central bank is an ideology, right? So it's a set of, of ideas. Yeah. Some ideologies are true and some are false. And uh, in the challenge as human beings we face is discovery of truth. That that's That's the fundamental goal that we all have is to discover what is true, you know, and our only tool to do that is the uh, Rand's argument is reason, a fact. So if we're trying constantly to discover truth and what happens is people get caught up in big explanations that might not be related to reality, might not be related to the truth. And then they spend their life evading. So a Marxist I think is constantly evading reality in order to justify his Marxism because it, it it doesn't work, right? It does. The, the the advocate for the central bank is constantly evading inflation and facts and and all the bad things that happen and the theory that just doesn't make any sense. But he's evading it in order to justify his beliefs. An honest person, a good person, and this is where a thinking person. This is where the great tragedy is. I don't think that you know the, that many of them, at least not at the most sophisticated level. Uh, is always trying to look for the truth, right? So the ideology is ultimately the truth. And if 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 I say something and you say, but here's a fact that contradicts it, my responsibility is to think that through, is to figure it out. It, maybe you're wrong, maybe I'm wrong. But what matters is not who's right or who's wrong. What matters is what is right, what is what is true. Yeah, agreed with that. It just seems like a really pernicious problem because even in my mind i'm coming to i'm thinking of people that are incredibly bright uh probably have even discovered truth to some extent right um you know i hmm, what am i thinking of here someone understands how money works right let's just say a hundred some odd years ago you're kind of faced with a situation you could one go out and educate the public hey central banking's a scam we need to move to a gold standard you can become a traditional gold bug right that would be one yeah. path yeah pretty hard path right you're just going to go out there try to educate an unwilling mass of people that doesn't want to learn there's this kind of first order thinking your second option would be oh i guess i'll go engage in central banking right become a shareholder or whatever start your own whatever you could, in that case, there'd be a much more profitable path to deception and a much less profitable, if not pointless path to trying to educate the masses. And I know things are changing over time. You know, in the modern today, we're fortunate to have digital media. So maybe education's working a little bit better. I'm not sure. But um, I guess the point no, I'm trying to make is that we've been, we've been trapped in a way and that it just hasn't, it's been more profitable to deceive and coerce 
than it has been to not do that. So people have been led astray over time. Is that how we got into the situation? So partially, partially for some people, it's been more, I would say, superficially profitable because I don't think it is more profitable to deceive. Um, I don't think it's more profitable in the sense of happiness to deceive. I, I think it'd be more profitable in the sense of money. Yes, agreed with but, that. I, I mean, purely financially, yeah. Yeah, but money, money is not happiness. So financially, yes, I think a lot of people are incentivized to be part of the system. And why challenge the system when it is? And that's why some people argue that you're not going to get dramatic change until the system collapses. And maybe that's true. But I, I fear that what happens when a system collapses is you get even worse because because people people are looking for not for solutions, they're looking for authoritarians, they're looking for somebody to tell them how things should work. But who knows, maybe we do need a collapse of a part of the system in order to come up with a new one. Education is hard. Education against the status quo is hard. Educating people to tell them that everything they believed up to this point was wrong. But look, it's it's happened. Think about the United States in 1776, right? Uh, this country that was founded on the principle of freedom. And it, lots of flaws and lots of problems. But the fundamental principle on which this country was founded was a positive, good one, right? And, and one could argue that periods in, in this country, uh, that really manifested itself. But before 1776, there had never been a country like this. Um, and before 76, everybody, everybody in the world, basically their conception of politics was a king, a, a council, a tribal leader, some kind of dictator telling me what to do, and I just go ahead and do it. And then I'd say somewhere in the between the 16th and the 19th century, there was a real revolution, uh, an intellectual revolution, a, a educational revolution. People were taught to think for themselves. People were taught that they fate should, you know, people used to not decide what profession they had. They used to do whatever their father did uh, by law, right? But you had a, you belonged to a guild and you did what your father did. Or you didn't choose who you married. Everything was arranged. You didn't choose where you lived. So there were no choices open to human beings. And then they learned that choices were a good thing and they could make choices because they had the capacity to reason. So the Enlightenment, from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, what you saw is a process of education where a lot of the corruption and a lot of the bad ideas and a lot of the horrors of the past were dumped and we got on a better path. So it is possible to change the world. It is possible to educate people. It is possible uh, to, to, to have a positive impact on the world. I mean, look at the civil rights movement, right? There was this attitude that blacks only half human and we had Jim Crow laws and we treated them really, really badly. And then, you know, it changed. P people, people rose up against it and educated people. And ultimately, I think racism is a lot less of a problem today than it was, you know, 60, 70 years ago. So there are certain ideas that can change. And I think that's true of every one of the issues that we think is a problem in the world today. We can change it. It's not easy. It takes a long time. And sometimes it takes a catalyst. Sometimes it takes something like a crisis or, or um, a, a movement or some drama to get people to think outside of the box. But it is possible. And, you know, there's no real alternative to it. The only other alternative is to impose it on people by force. And, and that's never a good solution. Yeah, it can never work because you just can't. Well, you can't force people to freely choose, right? It's a contradiction in terms. Exactly. Um, well, and one of the things here, I think Anne is, or Rand is really doing well is she's taking this uh, typically considered subjective realm of ethics and trying to root it in something more objective. And that seems really important. Um, I'll read an excerpt here. I'm on page 19 now. She writes, ethics is not a myth a mystic fantasy, nor a social convention, nor dispensable subjective luxury to be switched or discarded in any emergency. Ethics is an objective metaphysical necessity of man's survival, not by the grace of the supernatural, nor of your neighbors, nor your whims, but by the grace of reality and the nature of life. I quote from Galt's speech, Man has been called a rational being, but rationality is a matter of choice, and the alternative his nature offers him is rational being or suicidal animal. 
man has to be man by choice. He has to hold his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the values it requires and practice his virtues by choice. A code of values accepted by choice is a code of morality. And she finally goes on to write, If some men do not choose to think but survive by imitating and repeating like trained animals, the routine of sounds and motions they learn from others, never making an effort to understand their own work, it still remains true that their survival is made possible only by those who did choose to think and to discover the motions they are repeating. So maybe that partially answers my question earlier is that you know a lot of people can get by without thinking by benefiting from the previous thinking of others they're just imitating yep and that's a lot of what we're doing right in in culture as you grow that's what kids do that's how children develop is they imitate the people they see around them so partially so this is part of the part of the issue is is if a child only learns to imitate and it, it, it dedicates himself only to imitating. He grows up to be an adult, I think, mostly, that is is an imitator. I think it's one thing to just imitate. It's another thing to try to understand what the other person is doing and to maybe copy it, but with understanding, right? And then one gains understanding. And then there also, you know, if you think about, I don't know how much you know about Montessori education, but what Montessori does in, in, in pre-K is she lets the kids work with stuff themselves so you learn not by imitating they learn by doing by creating and and by figuring it out and then what you're teaching kids hopefully is to use this this tool that we have this reasoning capability and and to yeah you're rediscovering something everybody else knows but you're discovering it for you rather than just imitating and being a monkey. So um, it matters, even as children, how we learn what we learn and how we develop how we develop uh, ourselves. And like what, what Rand is saying is, you know, in the evolutionary process, something happened between animal and human being. Animals don't have free will. Human beings do. Animals, it's all coded. Um, and in a sense, they don't have choice. And, and what's good for them and what's bad for them is coded. It's in the programming. Human beings can be animals. We can just go by what's in there, by emotion, by whatever coding, by imitation, by whatever. But to re and then we're just animals. But to be human is to engage in what makes us uniquely human, human which is reason. And to do that, one has to choose it. So the whole issue of free will boils down for her to this choice. Do I choose to be a human being? And that means, do I choose to think for myself? Do I choose to engage with reason? And hard to tell how many people actually do that or how many people do that consistently in their lives. I would argue that few people do it consistently in their life. But that's what it means to be a human being. It means to engage your mind consistently with the challenges you face and not be an imitator. It doesn't mean you don't do things that other people do. But if you do it, understand what you're doing, understand why you're doing it. Yes. Well, well said. I'm okay. So just thinking out loud here, if I'll say a few things and then I'll please tell me if you agree, disagree, where you think I could be wrong. If reality, I've heard it put this way, that reality is that to which life is adapted. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like animals are essentially just adapted to that reality, right? That's what the process of natural selection is that the organism is fit to its environment. But it seems like perhaps humans have a different relationship with reality that we're actually, to some some extent, changing our realities, right? When we engage in these imaginary, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm an American citizen. That doesn't mean anything in objective reality. That's something we constructed, but it's a very useful fiction that changes the way we interact with one another. So is well, it well, is that the the step change that humans are sort of reshaping their realities, or maybe another way to put this is creating alternative realities that we're operating yeah. within? No, I don't. I don't think it's an alternative reality. And the fact that you're an American is reality. It's a reality now that human beings have created. We've created laws. We've created borders. We've created a structures that don't exist. If there are no humans, 
There's no America, right? And and there's only an America if 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 we've created something. So what human beings have the ability to do, which animals do not, for the you know you could argue birds make nests and stuff, but at a very minimal scale, we shape reality. We change the world, and we shape it both at the um, concrete physical level. We knock down mountains and build skyscrapers. Right, and we 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 knock down trees and we farm. No animal does that, right? They just accept reality, they accept nature as it is, and they either adapt to it or they die. We, if it gets, you know, this is my whole claim about climate change. If it gets warmer, we'll adapt, right? We'll change the world. We'll right. build dikes. We'll I don't know suck CO two out of the atmosphere. We'll do something. This is not, you know, this is how we survive as human beings. We change our environment, so. And, and so, so some of that is in the physical world, but some of that is also the fact that we have the ability to abstract. We have the ability to create abstractions like the United States of America. It's an abstraction. It's an abstraction that represents a certain geography and a certain set of laws, but it's an abstraction. But that abstraction is tied to reality. It's related to things that are actually going on. But it's a reality that only exists because we have chosen it. We've chosen to create it. Um, and it represents something real. So it's not an alternative reality. It's taking the world as we see it and adding to it, you know, uh, uh, building on top of it. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we talked, to, I think we talked in the past about concept formation. And um, is, does furniture exist? Well, yes, in a sense that you can point to a bunch of different things that are furniture, but furniture as an abstraction that represents all these things is something that we create in order to explain the world out there so we can more easily communicate, but more importantly, more easily think about the world. Right? So, um, you know, chair is a concept that represents all chairs that have ever existed, that ever will exist, no matter what their specific shape or everything. So there's differences between chairs, but we understand what chair means. And that is a tool, a cognitive, uh, you know, the basis of our cognition, which no other animal has. But it's it's an abstraction that represents a concrete reality, something real in the world out there. Yeah, so the, then animals would be somewhat strictly subjected to reality, but humans are in this co-evolutionary relationship, right? We're like, we reshape reality. But if reality is that to which we're adapted, then we're also changing our own adaptation, right? We're yeah, we're, I mean, we're different beauty, now. We're we're different running literacy, for instance, than we are not running literacy. Absolutely. So so evolution did this amazing thing with human beings. It allowed us to self program, right? So, uh, so that, that, animals, is that the key difference in the self programming between man and animal? In in a sense, yes. I mean, I, the analogy is not perfect. But yes, uh, you know, we can change us, our, ourselves because we can change our attitudes. We can change our, you know, we can get healthier. We can get strong. I can go lift weights and get stronger. I can, I can decide can learn not a foreign to. language. Yeah, I can learn a foreign language. I, I can learn to climb a mountain. I can do all kinds, or I can take equipment to climb a mountain. That's the beauty of it, right? I can take oxygen to climb Everest, right? That's a way in which I've used, I've changed reality. I've created this machine to help me. Uh, overcome a certain part of reality. You have air conditioning if it gets warm. So it's it's we get we get to write the program, and that's what reason, in a sense, is. Reason is our ability to understand the world out there, and then to adapt at least our mental capabilities to it, and then use it to take that reality and reshape it, to take the nature and reshape nature. And look, in in the end reality doesn't change because we you know the atoms and the molecules are still there we just we're, we but we're changing we have the ability to change the form from one to another to yeah fit yeah. Our needs. yeah it makes makes a lot of sense so i mean again the way i'm interpreting this uh and i've, I've heard it put this way before too that thinking is like a, a simulation engine for action you know you can spin up if I do this, I think A, B, and C will happen. If I do that, D, E, and F will happen. You can sort of compare and contrast different paths of action, and then you choose, yeah. right? You 
you rationalize or you reason and you choose a path that you think is mo- most suitable to your desired ends. Yes. Um, absolutely. So I, I want to, that all makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I want to ask you about the furniture concept though. You just said, is that essentially, what is the difference between abstracting into furniture, for instance, right? And the concept of a chair, for instance, with just single yeah. one piece of furniture out, isn't that the the form? Isn't that the platonic form of a chair? And then we have all these instances where we actually physically manifest that form into reality. No, so uh, there is no chair in another dimension that we're linking to, and chair didn't exist in our in our mind before we came up with it. So chair comes from looking at this and this and this and seeing the similarities abstracting away the differences and saying what I see here all is united under a particular concept, but it's a concept that's tied to these chairs. It's not a concept that's tied to another dimension. And then somebody can tell me, Oh, I have a means to communicate with other dimension and and you've got your chairs all wrong. Like they would in banking. I was like, they would in something a lot more abstract where they can, they can fool us. So Platonism is the heart of all, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but but maybe not so much. At the end of the day, Platonism is the source of all um, uh, fakery, of all um, of the deception that we experience, right? Because at, Plato is the villain in human history, in in a sense of in a sense of all the bad outcomes. Because what is more powerful than me saying? I can communicate with another dimension where the truth is really holds. What you're seeing here is not the true truth. The true truth is up is somewhere else. And only the philosopher can communicate with them. So only a handful of people can actually communicate with the world of truth. Well, the rest of us are in shadows in a cave, seeing shadows. We don't see reality. So we need to listen to the guy who communicates with the truth, whether that's the Pope whether that's um, you, you know uh, uh, Lenin who communicates with the with the world of the proletarian, um, whether that's Hitler who knows exactly what's good for the Aryan race, um, it, you know most m- most bad ideas at the end of the day we accept because some authority has told us and has devised a whole scheme around, and that authoritarian ideal idea that only authorities know the truth comes directly from Plato. Um, Whereas Aristotle, if you think about the difference between the two, Aristotle tells us every single individual has access to the truth. Every single one of us can see the chairs. Every single one of us can form that concept. We don't need a philosopher king. We don't need an authoritarian to come and tell us what it is. We can see it. We don't live in a cave. We're all out in the sunshine. We could be mistaken. We can make errors, but they're all fixable. The fixable by means of reason. So Plato, uh, in a sense, is anti-reason. He's, he says he's pro-reason, but his reason undermines the very foundation of what reason is because it detaches it from reality. It detaches it from my experience of reality. So it detaches the chair from the chair that's right in front of me. So that is not at all how I understood Plato, but I'll, I would also just throw this in there. There have been many analysis analyses of Plato's work from a lot of different angles, and I, I can't even begin to speak intelligently to it. I've read just a few, um, and maybe the analysis I read was different than that one. But uh, what I'd like to ask though is, what about okay? Point taken on chairs, we can all see chairs. We can establish the form of chairs. We can convert perceptions into conceptions, and then communicate about them. What about beauty? goodness, justice? What about things like this? How do they fit into the Ayn Rand objectivist worldview? They're exactly the same as Che, just harder, right? Uh, mm-hmm. At a much higher level of abstraction. So um, to, uh, let's take, um, beauty's hard. Let's take justice. And we can go back to beauty if you want, but let's take justice. Um, what does justice mean? Well, justice means, uh, you know, uh, that people get what they deserve, you know, what they deserve to get. Um, so we look at the world as children or as uh, primitive humans, and um, and we see somebody 
who um, we view as uh, doing good things, right things, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in uh, consistent with reality. And then we see, I don't know, the tribal leader chopping off his head for no reason. And we go, wait a minute, something here is wrong, right? Um, and then we see a criminal uh, getting his head chopped off. And we say, okay, but both of them got their chopped off. Something is off here, right? The good guy got his chopped head chopped and the bad guy didn't. And maybe from that, we get the sense of, well, one of them is right and one of them is wrong. And, but it, right and wrong in a particular way in getting your dessert or not getting your dessert. Well, let's give that a word, call it justice, right? And really probably kids experience it with, I don't know, I didn't get the slice of pizza. Other people did get the slice of pizza, right? Um, and, 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 a, and a lot of other, you know, a lot of other experiences, the bully, um, the bully gets away with it, right? He, he, he trip every time I walk by him, it trips me up and he gets away with it. And then when I attack him, when I defend myself, I get suspended from school, right? Something's wrong here. It's unjust, right? It's, I'm not getting what I deserve to get. So you see, we form the concept of justice from my experiences and from my understanding of the world. Now it depends on a bunch of other concepts because it depends on the idea of right and wrong, it depends on the idea of a good person, a bad person, things like that. It, it depends on the concept, for example, with the thief of theft is wrong. So justice is way up here. There are a lot of other concepts we have to build before we get to it. But it is just as connected to reality, to the facts as a chair is. It just requires more work to see the connection. But it's it, if we do it right, the connection should be there. Got it. So those would be just the highest order conceptions, right? Built on top of other conceptions. Like you said, good and evil, you had to build your way up to justice. I mean, if we look at beauty, you know, beauty is difficult because um, we don't, justice, we can argue about definitions, but we all have kind of a sense of definition. Beauty is very difficult because we haven't, as a civilization, really have a good conception of, of beauty. But uh, you know, when we look, we you know, when we see something as as a child, we see, oh, that is, you know, creates a certain positive emotion in me. I I, I feel attracted to that. I feel attracted to this. I, you know, that's pretty music. That's a pretty woman. That's pretty a view. And all of these, what's common to them? And then that's how you'd form, you know, a certain symmetry, a certain emotional evocation. Um, and and you start forming that, oh, these are all beautiful. They're all, but again, you have to extract it from your experiences. Um, and the more abstract you get, the the the, 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 the more difficult it is, but, it, but it's all the same process. And it's all a process that you should ultimately be able to take any concept you have and bring it down to the, to the level where you're just pointing. See, there it is. There's justice. There's beauty. There's this. Because you should understand how all these concepts are related. That's what doing the real work to really understand your own thinking requires. Yeah, it seems difficult, especially to interpret beauty through the objectivist lens, given that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as is said. So it's I don't want to say entirely subjective, but at least there's a subjective element to it. Um, now, let me ask you about this. So I talked to cognitive scientist John Ravakey for a while, and he has this notion. Um, there's there's certain aspects of reality that he, he deems neither subjective nor objective. For instance, uh, adaptability, or, or you could use a real simple example, the graspability of a cup. He says, okay, where is the graspability of a cup? Is it objectively in the hand or is it, is it, yeah, is it he, objectively in the cup? He's no, using it exists. objective wrong, right? This is the problem with. Well, the, the point would be this. Um, the, the question I want to ask yeah. is it exists between the hand and the cup, right? The cup is purpose built for the hand, the hand purpose built the cup for the hand. So yeah. where, where does something like graspability reside in a subject object paradigm so i don't buy the subject 
object paradigm. That is, I, I don't like that terminology. Subjective is 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 refers only to what's 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 for you or it basically says there's no relationship to a reality it's all whatever i want it to be it's 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 fundamentally a, a whim based reality the the alternative to subjectivity has always been in the history of ideas intrinsicism intrinsicism it's intrinsic in the thing it's intrinsic in the cup right that it it be held well right but then you go, but my hand is too small for that cup, so it doesn't work. So, but that's intrinsic; it's in the thing, and and so something is good because goodness is in it. And again, that would be Plato. Plato, the goodness is in the thing that you're observing as good. And uh, uh, some philosophers would say, no, goodness is whatever I want it to be, whatever I feel like it is. And what Rand is saying is that there is something called objective which is not the way most people use the term, but the way she uses it. An objective is that interaction between our consciousness and the reality. Subjective is the cup to the size of my hand, right? Objective is that thing is good for me, given my nature, given who I am, it's good for me. That's so objective. Fitness and or fittedness. Is objective, right? Fittedness right is would be a is 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 objective fit it's it's fit for the purpose it's fit for what i am as a human being okay so that then that term as she's using it is different than how most people use it yes. right yes. okay and that's a lot of terms unfortunately rand uses she um you know i think she's trying to stick to some kind of um uh uh definition of them that most of the culture often doesn't accept like you know she uses selfishness as a term very differently than the culture uses selfishness that's why you know you're reading the virtue of selfishness most people will say that's a contradiction in term virtue and selfishness they don't go together but she uh, and partially they're saying that because they view selfishness as lying cheating stealing, doing whatever it takes to get your way and she's saying oh no 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 uh, selfishness is doing what really is good for you what's rationally good for you. So it, in, in that sense, her selfishness equals long-term rational self-interest, right? But that's her, defi that's her definition. She would say it's the right definition, definition that fits reality, um, but it's a definition we have to convince people of. It's not a definition that's self-evident to people. That makes sense. Do you think a lot of the maybe resistance objectivism has encountered in becoming more of a, a widespread philosophy or idea is the, the ambiguity of terminology where you're using a word. Like I love this. I didn't know this until just now when you said this, that yeah. objectivism was more like fittedness or fitness that again. And if I'm looking at the world through Verveke's eyes, he calls that transjective because he's saying that objective would be like, what is out there, right? The subjective is how you're seeing it but the actual relationship between the two things is something a little bit different, but it sounds like that's how Rand is using the term objectivism. Yeah. Because, because uh, I mean, um, how you see it is again, you can be subjective in how you see something. You can make it up. You can, you can uh, distort it on purpose. You can shut one eye and only see half of the picture. Obje being objective about seeing something means actually engaging with the facts with reality right so that's what a being objective means and uh, that means that if both of us look at the same thing we will see the same thing and if we don't we will you know we have a tool to communicate and try to figure out you know whether the what we're seeing is the same thing right so uh, two people can look under a microscope and see completely different things because one's a scientist and one's a layman and the layman just sees a bunch of blotches and the scientist sees, I don't know, bacteria, right. Or, or, or a virus or something. And, you know, so each one of them is seeing what they're seeing. Reality is exactly the same. It's, it's, it is what it is. Obje uh, but, and both are being objective in a sense that, uh, you know, their knowledge, but the scientist knows more. <laughs> So what mm -hmm. he's showing in the slide represents 
uh, more information about reality than what the layman is showing. And he can potentially explain it to the layman. He can show him using reason. Here's a theory. Here's what a bacteria looks like. This is what a bacteria is. Here, look again. Now you'll see the same thing, but your understanding of it will be completely different. That, so sorry, that's, be, that's a, you know, so reality is what it is. Your, you know, object, ob objectivity means you're looking at reality. You're using your knowledge to help understand reality and, and you're accepting reality as the reality is. And that's being objective. Um, reality doesn't implant itself on you and you don't make it up as you go along. Subjectivism in philosophy means I make up reality. Intrinsicism in philosophy, reality implants itself on, on my senses. And objectivism says you have to make an effort using your mind to engage with reality, understand it, know it, learn it. And that's being objective. Got it. Okay. So yeah, this um, proper fittedness to reality. And this was something, again, in the Platonic book that I read, it was saying that reason and love both pursue that end, that it's trying to get proper fittedness to reality. And I, the example you just gave where you have the scientists looking at the bacterium and the layman, the layman just sees blobs, the scientist sees something describable right within his theory that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me the the example i love on this particular point is the rising and setting sun you know humans watch the sun rising and setting for millennia we always yeah. assumed here we are on earth the sun just keeps going around and around and around us then along comes this guy named copernicus says oh no actually we're the ones revolving around the sun and all of a sudden, in a flash of insight, all of that past data of sun rising and sunsetting is reinterpreted, right, through a new theory. So the data well, but didn't the change, theory, but the interpretation changed. But the, yes, but the but there was new data as well, right? So the, the the you cannot get a Copernicus without new observations, right? New data, and therefore a new understanding. And it's not that one theory is it's it's that we got closer to the truth. That is, and that's the beauty of the process. If we do it right, is we're constantly moving towards a greater understanding of the truth. We're adding observations, and then we realize that the previous explanation doesn't explain these new observations. We have to have another explanation, and then we test that explanation out again by observation to to confirm it. And then, if you think about Copernicus, Galileo refines Copernicus, uh, Kepler refines. You know, so there's there's a process of refining because. Um, um, uh, Copernicus doesn't get it quite right, but he gets that we're going around the sun, which is a revolution. Um, and people hold on to the old dogma in spite of that, right? Just like in everything else, you can you can you can come up, we can discover the truth, and people want to hold on to that old dogma because it's comfortable, because they don't have to reinterpret an ancient book, because the book said the other way around, so they they stick with the book. The authority said it. The person connected to the world of form said that the sun goes around the earth, so therefore it must be. And so, you know, it's a challenge to all the authorities out there. And, and that's why Copernicus particularly, it's not just a scientific, it's a political statement because he's challenging the authority, particularly of the church, with regard to who discovers truth. The truth is not in an ancient book. The truth is not what the Pope tells us it is. The truth is what we observe. And we can, as, as individuals, we can discover truth. And that makes it a political statement, which is massive. Hmm. Changing the world in that sense in even a bigger way than just our understanding of the sun. Hmm. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. 
Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. All right, so I'm going to read an excerpt from page 20 now. Rand writes, the men who attempt to survive, not by means of reason, but by means of force, are attempting to survive by the method of animals. But just as animals would not be able to survive by attempting the method of plants, by rejecting locomotion and waiting for the soil to feed them, so men cannot survive by attempting the method of animals, by rejecting reason and counting on productive men to serve as their prey. Such looters may achieve their goals for the range of a moment at the price of destruction, the destruction of their victims and their own. As evidence, I offer you any criminal or any dictatorship. And she goes on to write that man has to be man by choice, and it is the task of ethics to teach him how to live like man. The objectivist ethics holds man's life as the standard of value and his own life as the ethical purpose of every individual man. The difference between standard and purpose is in this context is as follows. A standard is an abstract principle that serves as a measurement or gauge to guide a man's choices in the achievement of a concrete, specific purpose. Finally, she says, the three cardinal values of the objectivist ethics and the three values which together are the means to and the realization of one's, one's ultimate value, one's own life, are reason, purpose, self-esteem, with their three corresponding virtues, rationality, productiveness, pride. Um, okay, so I really like that opening part, which is saying basically, you know, animals can't live like plants in the same way that humans cannot live like animals. Um, if we abandon ethics, then we are... This is equivalent to abandoning reason to some extent, and this leads to self-destructive patterns of action for the species, basically. Well, for the individual and for species, that is any individual, she's saying any individual who abandons reason um, and therefore abandons ethics is acting towards his own destruction. Um, and, and yes, he might get the money, but he is destroying himself in, in some way, and ultimately, um, he, he will not live to the full potential of, as a human being. He won't live a human life. Uh, and if you think, and she says, look at crooks, right? So if you look at any criminal, um, yeah, they might, and, and here you can see how the, the popular culture is very different in Rand, right? So if you look at most movies, the crook is always the happy one, the successful one, the one who gets the girls, the one who's partying and happy. And the good guy are always torn with guilt, divorced, miserable. All they have is a job they hate, you know, like the cop and the, the good guy and the bad guy, right? The bad guys are always more colorful and more interesting than the good guys. But in reality, the bad guys are horrible. They live lives where they're afraid because they're going to get caught. They live lives where they, um, they have no self-esteem because they know they didn't produce anything all they did was take it from people who actually did. And if the value of our self-esteem as human beings is the use of our reason for the purpose of producing the things that we consume, they have none. Um, and, it, you, you know, so you look at uh, you look at somebody like Bernie Madoff. Um, hopefully people remember him. He's the guy who created the largest pyramid scheme um, uh, 
you know, illegal payment scheme, a bunch of legal payment schemes, but the largest <laughs> illegal payment schemes we've seen. And, you know, he says that he was happier in jail than he was before he was caught. Why? Because he was stealing his friends. So he had no friends. He could never really open up to them. He could never look them in the eye. He could never live kind of freely. He 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 was constantly in fear. Ultimately, he was discovered and turned into the authorities by his children. Imagine being discovered and being turned into the police by your children, what that does to a human being. So he was miserable. He was he had a horrible life, even though he had like $50 billion of other people's money. He, he, he couldn't he couldn't use it. He couldn't live by it. He couldn't do anything because he couldn't enjoy it because he had no real self, no self-esteem. And, you know, if you look at I like to say, have you ever met a happy politician? I haven't. I mean, you look at somebody like Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton, they look like miserable, pathetic human beings. I mean, it's it's in their features. And, you know, these are not happy people. These are not successful people, not success measured by the standard of human happiness. Uh, so deception, lying, stealing, cheating, um, you know, short term thinking. We all know that when we make mistakes in life and we look back, we, we never say I thought about that too much. It's almost always I didn't I didn't think it through. I followed my emotions. I did what was short term. I didn't think about the long term. Um, things like that, right? Uh, uh, you know, a husband who cheats on his wife uh, regularly, it, you know, he's uh, assuming he loves his wife and he wants that relationship to continue, right? He's lying to his, he's getting a thrill. He gets the thrill of the moment of the sexual encounter, but at what expense? And if he thought about it in advance and he weighed the option, would you rationally say, I'd rather have the thrill than a relationship with my wife? No, but he gets caught up in the moment. So whenever we put aside reason, whenever we reject the long term, whenever we reject uh, our, our real values, our long term values, that's when we get into trouble. And that's where we do ourselves harm. And that's where we move. If, if life is a process of moving to life or to death, every one of those actions moves us a little bit to death. And, and, and reason is what moves us towards life. And that's kind of what she's talking about. And so the thief, the criminal, the many politicians, they're not living, not in the human sense. So they are, I mean, whether it's legal or illegal, they're looting or gaining some material advantage or wealth at the expense of destroying their self-esteem. That's right. That's right. And and, yeah. and destroying their, their potential to be happy. Right. That makes, makes a lot of sense. Why do you think... I'm, I'm not going to hold you to this because I would assume this is a speculative question and answer, but why are the bad guys portrayed that way in films as the more colorful, interesting characters and the good guys oh. are portrayed so dismally? Oh, I mean, it's a direct consequence of the morality that the moral code that I think our culture holds as primary. And that is morality, we are told, primarily from Christianity onwards, morality is hard. Morality is about suffering. Morality is about sacrifice. Saints, people who become saints, always have miserable, horrible deaths, right? Happy people don't become saints. So we, we assume that somebody who's good is going to be unhappy. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the, the, the German philosopher, um, secularized this idea. And he, he basically said, if you meet somebody, somebody happy, you got to be suspicious of them. They're probably not moral. They're probably not good because goodness, goodness is hard. Goodness means sacrifice. Goodness is being selfless. And you can't be happy if you're selfless. Uh, you know, so this person probably pursued their own interests, their own. And that's not good. We know that's immoral. So it's the conception of morality as of being selfless that leads us to believe that good is associated with suffering. And therefore, if you're good, you're not going to have fun, right? You're not going to be happy. You're not going to do good. You're not going to attract the best people. Um, it's it's the devil. The devil uh, is selfish. He's he's pursuing his own values, his own interests. He's out there doing what he wants to do. He's having fun. Um, so it's always in portrayals and arts, the devil is always the joyous, happy, go lucky kind of guy. 
and the people of virtue that he's trying to seduce are, are miserable, suffering, um, and and um, and and not enjoying life because that's the conception of morality that Christianity has taught taught us. Hmm. Is there some? This is so. There's not the the there did, does not appear to be bright lines to me because there seems to be some element of truth there that if you just purely you know animalistically pursue your own ends sure. like uh like we we're saying earlier i'm just gonna you know have every sexual encounter drink every drink sure. steal sure. whatever sure. occurs to me that that is self-destructive obviously there has to be some self-constraint or discipline well absolutely so the self self constraint and discipline is your self-interest mm. properly understood right gotcha. that's the right what is really good for me oh i really love my wife I, i'd like to have a long-term relationship with her you know it's easy then the, the 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 sexy girl at the bar is no longer appealing once you bring in the context of i care about my values right i care about what's good for me right uh and therefore i'm not gonna be seduced by the momentary i am gonna think long term but what 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 um Contemporary morality, and again, contemporary morality, look, most people are mixed. Most people take bits and pieces of different moral codes and they mush them together. You can't really live by a morality that says be selfless. It's 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 too destructive. But if you think about if you think about um what people consider as moral ideal, it's somebody like a Mother Teresa. Everybody admires Mother Teresa. Why? Because she gave up a middle class livelihood, she gave up a middle class family, she gave up what could have been money and wealth, and she went to the worst place in the world to help the worst off people in the world rise a little bit. It didn't even make them successful. That wasn't her purpose. Just, just not die, right? And she was miserable. She was miserable. You can read her diaries. That's what makes her noble. That's what makes her great. The fact that she was willing to suffer everything for what they believe is a noble cause. But, and when you see somebody like a successful businessman, I, you know, and, and, and it's hard to use a contemporary figure, but let's just for fun use Elon Musk just because he's such a colorful character, right? And he's, um, you know, he seems to be having fun. He seems to be enjoying himself. Um, he, he's incredibly productive. He's obviously brilliant. He's doing amazing things. And people love to hate him because, he can be moral if he's doing, you know, he's just having kids with all kinds of women and, and you know, he's uh, populating the world all by himself. Uh, but he's doing it kind of without the perception of guilt. He doesn't he doesn't seem to feel guilty about all this. He seems to be really pursuing at some ex to some extent. He's flawed, but to some extent, his self-interest and people love to hate that because what the hell? Who is he? Yeah, I, I'm I'm curious here how closely the rejection of reason is related to uh, the concept of time preference in Austrian economics. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but basically, Oh yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. Um, and it's, it's definitely so related right? because, because time preference, um, first of all, uh, acknowledging that you have time preference, right? Acknowledging the importance of time preference is is an act of reason, right? It's 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 reality. It's identifying something in reality, you know, you, you, and and your ability to defer to the future, right? And to recognize though that if I'm deferring for the future, I expect a bigger reward, right? Because I have to discount it backwards, so I expect a bigger reward in the future than than I'm going to get just from from doing. And this is the whole point about the sexy girl at the bar and the marriage, right? That's you could think of it in terms of time preference, right? Yes, from an immediacy perspective. Right now, I'd have more fun with the girl at the ball. But if I discount the value of my relationship with my wife over the next 20, 30 years, at almost any discount rate, that's not, you know, uh, infinite, um, it's the value I get from that is much greater to me right now than the, the thing, than, than this. Uh, so if you have the, right. so discount, the, the acknowledgement of the fact that there's a discounting going on and there's a time preference going on is 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 part of what it means to think into the future and to plan. Yeah, that so, okay. So that makes a lot of sense. The seeing the sexy girl at the bar through the lens, through the larger temporal scope of your whole life, 
exactly kind of puts her in you know stacks her up uh apples to apples so to speak so you can see how little value there is relative to the you know ongoing relationship with your wife perfect would way it, to present yeah would it be proper to say this then that uh perhaps rand is advocating rather than being selfless towards others we should try to be selfless towards our future selves i mean is that kind of this no ethical... the opposite we want, we want our future selves to have to enjoy all the fruits of what we're doing now that's right? what i'm saying is selfless towards your future self so i'm going to do things now that will benefit my future self i'm going to work out i'm going to read i'm going to eat healthy these aren't my immediate things that i want to do necessarily but they compound and if I'm if I'm taking that larger view, then maybe yeah. That's but it, it's a, there's a sense in which, if that were true, if it was really uh, so hard now to do the right thing, then we would never do it because our future self is always in the future, and uh, you can always push it out further into the future and further into the future. And you would never do it, you know. So you would never have fun. You would never actually benefit from it. No, the the her perspective is if you do what is good for your future self you're also doing good for you right now. And ultimately, that integration, having that knowledge that this is good for me, me as a future, not just a present, that knowledge is what gives you the, the self-esteem, the pride, the, the you, know, you, you, you know you're being ethical, and all of that is what contributes to the fact that right now, even though I have to do this horrible workout, I'm basically a happy person. So I'm a happy person because of this knowledge and, and because I know that I will work out so that I can always be healthy, right? And, and the knowledge that I'm that kind of person that does this stuff is so much more important and so much more overwhelming in terms of happiness than the pain of the workout that it's, it's absolutely selfish. It's, there's no self, there's no iota of selflessness here. Mm. There's the exact opposite. I care about myself. That's why I do what I do. Mm. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So again, it's taking a holistic view, not a, not a narrow view. If, if I just view exercise health, right. Then I'm suffering now so I can be healthy later. But if I take the view of one of the, one of my most important values now and in the future is my health. And I take my health seriously. And part of my esteem, my self-esteem mm -hmm. comes from knowing that I take myself seriously. Then it broadens the 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 scope and now um i am uh i'm being selfish by by exercising it, it's not the suffering is not that bad you know i get perspective on what it is that i'm doing right so rand then let me try to reformulate this phrasing rand is advocating for long view selfishness rather than short view selfishness something like that yeah, but she would say short view selfishness is not selfishness because because it's self destructive. Because it's self destructive, it's right. contradictory. Got it. So short view selfishness, in quotes, is equal self destruction. Mm. So uh, lying, stealing, cheating to get the money right now is destructive not only for my future self, mm. but my present self as well because of the self esteem. I know I'm cheating. Mm. I know I'm not gaining it by the mechanisms of being human mm. and whether I can articulate that or not, I know, right. Mm. Because of the way the mind is, is, is built the way our human consciousness is built. I know. And therefore I am already suffering. Right. Even though right now I might feel pleasure. I'm really deep down suffering because I've emptied my self-esteem. I've, I've, I've taken that away. That makes sense. So the line then between long view selfishness and short view self-destruction would be this line of morality right like tell the truth don't steal no violence well, morality morality is an empirical question right so morality is what are the principles by which you should live to gain this kind of amazing life to gain uh this this life of long-term happiness and uh, and and uh, success at living so so morality being honest is not a commandment it's something that i learned that when i'm not bad stuff happens so i better be you know so it's it's good for me to be honest I, not only do i experience it but i understand why i understand that 
to be successful in life, one had to adhere to reality. Dishonesty is a mechanism by which I don't adhere to reality. So both theoretically and practically, I know or I gain the knowledge that these actions are good, those actions are bad. Very good. Okay. Reality so is the, is the principles that help me guide me to that long term self interest. Okay, that makes sense. I want to ask something. This is a little bit of a tangent, perhaps, and I don't know much about Ayn Rand's personal life, but in a lot of the interviews I've seen of her, she's typically smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Um, so I don't personally smoke cigarettes, but I have, I do drink alcohol currently. I've taken long periods of time off, like, you know, over a year at a time. Yeah. And I've, I've kind of wrestled that within myself. It's like, I enjoy drinking, but I also enjoy not drinking. Cause I, you know, it has all these other benefits, right? Your workouts get better. You can read more. You've got more time, et cetera. Yep. How, you know, in something like that, that's not lying, stealing, cheating, hurting anyone. How does that decision of like, you know, if I drink now, sure. It's, it seems like it's serving my short term selfishness. <laughs> Yeah. There's a point where it morality. becomes there's a point where it becomes self-destructive, obviously. Yeah. But you could so also still, say it could serve potentially your long view selfishness, depending on what you're doing when you're drinking. You know, if you're, I don't know, making business deals or something like that, it could serve your long-term self-interest. So how does something that's not immoral necessarily, like drinking to within a certain degrees, how does that fit into this uh view? What is interesting is that. Uh, there, there's going to be a line where something is moral or is not moral, depending on whether it's pro your life or not pro your life. And that line can be tricky to figure out, right? So uh, drinking has all these pluses and, and not drinking has all these pluses and these minus and weighing those, that's where it's going to depend on, on you, right? You're going to have to figure out where that line is. How much can I drink or, or should I drink, not drink at all? Those are, I think, optional, um, but it's within your context of how you, for example, respond to alcohol and what you do with your time and, and all of that. Um, it, I can imagine a circumstances where drinking is immoral because, I don't know, it, 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 your health deteriorates or you're allergic or, or, or you, you defect your brain or something. I can imagine the circumstances when not drinking is immoral. Let's say, let's say you really enjoy drinking a little bit. And uh, just because, I don't know, uh, some authority figure in your life said, stop drinking, Robert, don't do it. You stop drinking and you're not enjoying it because you remember, you know, the, that's immoral too. So it's not that the, it, it, so what morality demands is that you think about it. <laughs> morality demands that you weigh the options. Morality demands that you figure it out based on a, some kind of, real criteria the criteria of your life that you don't just give in to the emotion that you don't just do whatever happens to there's a drink on the table so you drink it that you think about it that you figure it out you're going to make mistakes sometimes you'll drink when you shouldn't and you know won't drink when you should but overall your morality is judged based on whether you think about it whether you use reason to evaluate the choice in the case of cigarettes um in the 1960s she did not believe the emerging science that uh, cigarettes were causing cancer. She just didn't buy it. She thought it was, you know, again, kind of the government government distorting. This is the problem when government gets involved in science. It's, it's hard to understand, to know. When her doctor, I think it's the early 70s, told her that the cigarettes were going to kill her, she went cold turkey. She stopped immediately. Wow. So I didn't know once that. she understood unequivocally that it was a life or death issue, it was easy for him, right? Wow. That's a quick yeah, thing. That's happened. impressive. Yeah, the same thing happened with Lena Peacock. He, he, you know, a student. He stopped at some point because he understood that it was a life or death issue. So, um, again, you can be mistaken. You, you can, oh, cigarettes, they don't do too much harm, and I enjoy them, and so on. And then suddenly you discover, wait a minute, they're doing harm. Oh, wait, I have to take action. Right? And uh, yeah, I that's, think we've gotten soft. I mean... The fact is that a lot of people used to stop smoking cold turkey, and then at some point, it became acceptable that it, it, you were what is it addicted to it, and 
a million excuses why you couldn't go to cold turkey. And I think it's it, the culture got soft more than anything. But my grandfather went cold turkey, stopped smoking, and, and I knew a lot of people who did. I never started, so I don't know what it felt like. Yeah, I fortunately never started either. My mother did go cold turkey as well. Um, and definitely- I think she was pretty much successful she may have relapsed once or twice but she she is successful now okay i want to ask you 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 threw out a term there earlier which i'm just now connecting that this morality is the weighing of options and you're trying to choose the one that is pro-life right that's kind of the 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 general aim of the objectivist ethics yes that term made me think of abortion which has okay. been recently um, a yeah. yeah. uh, very hot topic in national discourse. Do you know of Rand's views on abortion and how that fits into objectivist ethics? And if you want to skip this topic, we can, but I just thought I would ask. This is what causes, uh, this is what causes me every single time, a bunch of unsubscribers. Um, uh. Ayn Rand had a very strong view on abortion uh, and, and uh, she'd argue it fit completely into her theory. She was very pro-abortion. Uh, and she phrased it as pro-abortion, not just as pro-choice or pro-this. And she viewed the pro-abortion view as a pro-life view because the emphasis here was on the life of the mother. The, the emphasis was on the life of the woman. And, and forcing a woman to carry the term from her perspective was a way of infringing on the rights of the mother and as a way of um, uh, limiting the scope of the mother's life, telling him she she had to be a mother when, when she had the option not to be. Uh, Saran suddenly thought it was a no-brainer to allow abortions in the first, um, certainly in the first tri- uh, trimester, maybe in the first two trimesters. But she and 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 she thought it would, should be legal until until birth. Um, but morally, she suddenly thought it should be okay first and second trimester um, when there was no real conscious being there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it boils down to how you define human life, right? A lot of things are alive but we don't give them political rights. We don't protect them. Um, her view is that human life, human life is something that chooses and acts and uh, and uh, gains the idea of, of, of individual rights. Uh, you have to be an individual for that. And, uh, and, the, and, and birth is the individuating process. Birth is when you become an individual. So the political rights, the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness only apply once you're born you're not a you're you're alive but you don't have rights until you're born makes sense that's pretty consistent i think with rothbard's views as well that um he uses stronger language actually i think he called the fetus a parasite on the mother's body and the mother can is free to you know cleanse herself of the parasite whenever she wants Um, yeah obviously that that language is not conducive probably for a lot of productive dialogue but uh the point's well taken that i like that birth is the process of individual individuation um you know it's it's, it's a perceptually visible different human being versus while it's in the mother you know if life if human life is a process of uh, self-directed self-generating action self-directed, self-generating action. As long as the fetus is inside the woman, it is not self-directing and it's not self-generating anything. It is, uh, all its life processes are the result of the mother's choices, the mother is doing, the mother's being alive. Uh, It's only when it comes out is now is it self-generating and self, um, you know, it's it's, it's actually a, a separate individual human being and a live human being that's, acting for its own benefit. Now, it can't get it a lot because that's mm-hmm. biology to allow babies to, it's still dependent on the mother, but it's not attached to the mother. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have a cable attaching it to it, which is a, it's a big difference. Yeah. So once that cord is cut, it starts that process of at least to a limited extent, self-directing and self-generating its own action. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it does, the process of maturity is going fully into that right by the time you're an adult presumably you're yes hopefully self-directing it goes back to free will and choice hopefully by that point you have chosen to make yourself into a human being that's that's fully in control of their own life Mm, interesting okay i'll read a another couple of excerpts here i'm going to start on page 22 rand writes 
It means one's acceptance of the responsibility of forming one's own judgments and of living by the work of one's own mind, which is the virtue of independence. It means that one must never sacrifice one's convictions to the opinions or wishes of others, which is the virtue of integrity. That one must never attempt to fake reality in any manner, which is the virtue of honesty. That one must never seek or grant the unearned and undeserved, neither in matter nor in spirit, which is the virtue of justice. She goes on to write, productive work does not mean the unfocused performance of the motions of some job. It means the consciously chosen pursuit of a productive career in any line of rational endeavor, great or modest, on any level of ability. It is not the degree of man's ability nor the scale of his work that is ethically relevant here, but the fullest and most purposeful use of his mind. Finally, uh, bottom of 23, she writes, the basic social principle of the objectivist ethics is that life is that just as life is an end in itself, so every living human being is an end in himself, not the means to the ends or the welfare of others, and therefore that man must live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself. To live for his own sake means that the achievement of his own happiness is man's highest moral purpose. Um, okay. A few questions here. One, this, okay. I'm, I'm going back to the virtue of integrity. It, she says it means that one must never sacrifice one's convictions to the opinions or wishes of others. That seems to be extremely difficult, right? <laughs> to at least some extent, we're all persuaded by one another. We all, as you said earlier, I love the term self-programming because that seems to be the yeah. unique human capability, but we're also at least subtly or subliminally being programmed by those who we spend our time with, right? What, what shows we watch, what books we read, there's this so, there's so definitely think, an influence. So how do we balance like personal integrity without being just obstinate and, and immovable, right? We have to be open to influence to some extent. Yeah. So the, the, the challenge is not, uh, not to be influenced, but to control what is influencing us and to choose what to be. So you could flop down in front of the TV and just flip the channels and just hit on whatever, or you could, you know, you, you, you know, the kind of shows you like, you do a little bit of research, you say, okay, there are three shows I'm interested in. Here's some I'm going to, and, and you might read reviews that might be part of the influence and you might read a reviewer and he says, Oh, this is a great show. And then you watch it and it sucks then you write him off and you don't use that review anymore. So it's a process of being discriminating about who you allow to influence you, who you allow to, to, to and, and the influence needs to be conscious. It needs to be, I understand what I'm doing right now is I haven't had time to look at all the new Netflix shows. So I'm going to ask Robert what he thinks. And, and, and so I'm not doing it unconsciously. I'm doing consciously awareness and it's not contradicting my values. So if Robert says you should you should watch this show, but I watched the episode yesterday and I hated it, I'm not going to say, well, if Robert says, then I better watch. Then I'm going to override the fact that I hated it. I'm going to watch it anyway. People do that though, right? People right, do right. believable things. Um, so a man of integrity has certain values and they stick with those values. That doesn't mean he can't discover that a value is wrong, or that a value is misplaced, or that if he listens to Joe. He could uh, he could gain a new value that Joe has knowledge that that he doesn't have, so it doesn't mean you're closed off from the world around you. It means that whatever influence it has, you are in control of it, right? You're in control of of how much of an influence you're in control of your own actions, and you'll only act based on your values and based on what you actually know. That's helpful. Um, okay, I want to ask, so this last point she makes, that to live for his own sake means that the achievement of his own happiness is man's highest moral purpose. Now, pursuant to our discussion today, I think I get a better understanding of what she means, right? This is your, your long-term happiness as a human being, you're thriving, you're flourishing. This doesn't mean yeah. go and drink and do all the things for today and you know to hell with tomorrow. Um, 
but I, I just wanted to ask you about this because, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson's work. He makes this argument that happiness is like an emergent property of a well-ordered life. So he thinks people should more focus on responsibility, you know, clean your room and all this uh, rather than, than focusing on happiness. And I could say that, and maybe this is a prior misinterpretation on my own part, but in years past when I would aim at happiness, I think I ended up much more in that kind of um, short, what did we call it? Short view self-destruction yeah. to some extent. I just, I don't know. I had, maybe I had a misunderstanding what happiness meant. And then when I pointed life at responsibility instead, really try to just take on as much responsibility as I could, things got a lot better. So I'm wondering, is this another one of those terms that perhaps Rand is using slightly differently? Because in her view of long view happiness, there would be some responsibility built into that to some extent. Sure. In, I mean, the, in the self-constraint and self-discipline we described earlier. Yeah, but that's that's all part of the virtues, right? That's all part of morality. So what Ayn Rand is saying here is, if you want to be happy, if happiness is the ultimate moral purpose, then don't think about happiness. Think about morality. That is, morality properly understood will guide you to happiness, will guide you to success. So find the values that are important to you. Find the values that bring meaning to your life and, and uh, an achievement to your life. Their achievement will make you happy. That's what it means to be happy. It's to achieve those kind of values. And then live the kind of life that will make you happy. But it's not like, oh, wait, I need, what, do I, what am I doing today to make myself happy? It's not how it works. Happiness is indeed, in a sense, an emergent property. See, I think, I think Jordan, I, I think, I mean, I've heard Jordan Peterson say different things about happiness that, are, that where he doesn't even see it as an emergent property. He says it's more of an accident. Some people are happy. Some people will never be happy. And I, and I think that is very harmful and a mistake. You should want to be happy. You should strive to be happy. But the way you strive to be happy is by being moral, by being a good person, by taking on responsibility, by challenging yourself, by achieving. I mean, Rand says the three cardinal values in the previous section you read, reason, purpose, self-esteem. If you are guided by, if, if you take those values seriously, if you achieve reason, purpose, and self-esteem, the reward, the result, the emergent property, if you will, is happiness. So okay. note that happiness is not the value, right? Value, value is that which one acts to gain or keep. Value is what you want to get. Mm. What I want to get in a sense is I'm, I'm not setting a happiness. That's my value. No, my value is reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Those are the cardinal value. Mm. The consequence of that is happiness. Mm. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All right. That makes sense. So then moral, morality, and perhaps more generally moral codes are then valuable as pathways to happiness, right? These are- yeah, but it, Most moral codes are not, right? And most moral codes don't present themselves as such. So for example, a Christian moral code would say that some Christian moral codes, you get the, the different interpretations, right? But some Christian moral codes would say the purpose of morality is to connect you with God and you're not going to be happy in this life. Maybe in the, like Mother Teresa was never happy in this life. Maybe in the next life, maybe, you know, but even then uh, some thinkers say, no, happiness is too selfish of motivation. Um, it's the connection with God or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, other, other um, like a Kantian morality would say, the purpose of morality is to fulfill your duty. Happiness has nothing to do with it. Objectivism, Ayn Rand says, the purpose of morality is to give you the tools to achieve happiness. That's a purpose, right? The, 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 and that's why she says the moral purpose of your life, that is the purpose of your morality, is your happiness. Right. That's what it will achieve if you follow it. Okay, so that makes... that's unique to a selfish morality, a self-interested morality. Most moralities are not self-interested. Most moralities tell you to be selfless, not to be self-interested. So that makes sense to me, but I would push back and say that at least and i'm i'm just choosing christianity here because it's the one i'm most familiar with there are some aspects of it that align with what she's saying here right like the, one of the things christ told uh, his people like do not tell lies do not do what you hate 
love thy neighbor. You know, things like this seem to be uh But I don't aligned. love my neighbor. Right? Is love thy neighbor really Well, let's throw that one out. Let's just stay with yeah. do not tell lies, do not do what you hate. I mean, these Look, seem you have to have every every morality has to have some elements which are truthful and connected to reality because otherwise it would fail right and there have been a lot of models proposed that have failed because they propose things that are ridiculous uh so yes of course there's truth in christianity it, it can be all wrong I, you know i think most of it is but it, it can be all wrong because otherwise it would have not from evolutionary perspective survived um so i think there's elements of truth in there's elements that encourage human survival and facilitate human survival in every system of ideas what Rand is trying to do is boil it down to its essence and purify it, get rid of all the crap and, and, and just focus on the things that are essential for human survival, things that are essential for human success without the baggage. And I think what Christianity has is a lot of baggage on top of a few things that, yeah, kind of in agreement. Notice, though, the Christianity's focus on don't lie is on don't lie. That is, it's on your relationship with other people. Um, whereas objectivism's uh, focus on honesty is don't lie to yourself. That's the most important thing in honesty and in objectivist ethics is a commitment to the facts, a commitment to reality. And then as a part of that, don't lie to other people. But in a sense, that's secondary. The, the, the primary is commit yourself to reason, commit yourself to facts, commit yourself to reality. Don't... Um, don't deceive yourself is the biggest sin is self-deception. Right? Well, and the well, most difficult to avoid, obviously, yeah. um, you know, there, again, my conversation with Verveke, he makes this point that from a neurophysiological standpoint, the same machinery that allows us to adapt also opens us up perennially to self-deception. Yeah. So there's, we, you know, yeah. We have that ability. Animals can't self-deceive. Yeah, so once well, well, we can think. Once, we're, it's almost like we have to, again, this imaginary play, right? We have to try things on. We have to try things out. And inevitably, that ends up us going down some wrong paths, self-deceiving, learning our lessons, and then coming back and doing it again. So think how... Think about the programming right? If you're a self-programmer, you're going to make errors in the programming. If nature programs you, if you're completely programmed from the bat, that's it. You're programmed. There are no errors, right? Um, but self-programming by implication means that there's going to be uh, things you don't know, things you uh, make mistakes, and that can cause damage. That can cause harm. So we're not uh, – we have to be so alert as we program ourselves to get it right in a ways that animals don't have, they don't have that self-knowledge. They don't have that self-reflection. And most people don't reflect and most people don't think and most people don't. And therefore they can really screw it up. Right. So I think I'm going to ask you anyways, I think I might know the answer, but I want to ask. So does this mean to the extent that Christianity or any religion or wisdom tradition has these truths embedded in it, right? Do not tell lies. Do not do what you hate, for instance. To that extent, does religion, wisdom traditions, et cetera, they have utility to that extent, right? That they've given people these stories, people oh, yeah, internalize them. And then people, you know, I know a lot of really good people that are Christian people, right? And they follow a Christian ethos and they are happy. They live productive lives and they don't tell lies and all of these things. So I, 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 I don't want to... Today I guess my question what extent is, can they be happy? I'm not sure. So they can be to some extent. I'm not sure they can be fully happy. But but yes, look, religion, uh, Rand called religion, for example, a, a primitive form of philosophy. Hmm. The fact is that human beings need explanations. They need to understand the world around them. Uh, so the Greeks come up with philosophy, uh, the Jews and the Christians come up with religion, the Muslims come up with religion. But there are all ways where we're struggling to explain the world around us and explain who human beings are. And those explanations that are, have no resemblance to reality, a complete failure, are going to crash and burn very quickly. So there has to be some element of truth, and they have to, be, they have, to have some utility, in a sense, particularly from a historical perspective. Like, I don't think you could come up with Christianity 
under Muhammad, when Muhammad was alive. Mm. Because one of the things about Christianity is it's a, it's a, it's a religion of the underdog, right? It's a, it's a religion of the oppressed. If you think about how Christianity evolved, it evolved uh, in a minority. It evolved under the thumb of the Romans. It evolved uh, w- with, with humility. And Islam evolved from strength. Islam evolved right from the beginning. It was the ruling ideology. Right from the beginning, it had political power. It had so so Islam has a completely different attitude to politics. Christianity has to seize unto Caesar, to, to God unto God. Why? Because if you didn't do that, Caesar was going to crush you, right? You were gone. So you better. But Muhammad was the king. Muhammad was the equivalent of a king. So relig- uh, politics and religion are united completely. Right? So a lot of the the ways in which these religions evolved were consequence of what was going on at the time and what allowed the religion to survive and to thrive. Uh, Christianity uh, uh, spread among the weakened society, the oppressed, the people who felt like they were being, particularly in the early days, right? And then Augustine had to reconceive of Christianity to allow it to be um, powerful and to allow for invade, you know, forced conversions and things like that that, that, the, that the later Romans did. Islam didn't. Islam from the beginning, forced conversions were, were cool, right? They were good because they had power. They were strong. And Judaism, it depends on the phase. Judaism arose out of strength and then was weak. And um, so religions are, 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 are systems of thought to allow people to survive under the circumstances in which they exist um, and give them some kind of explanation about the world. But then all of them need to be judged based on reason. And the good stuff, if you will, kept, and the bad stuff thrown away. Got it. So, religion is somewhat of a proto philosophy, perhaps, yeah. and it's, that makes sense because in the East, right, we make this distinction in the West: religion versus philosophy. But in the East, there's no difference, really. Like Taoism yeah, because... and Hinduism, they're they're all bound up. So, yeah, in a sense, there was no Greece in the East, right? So. Right. And, and as a consequence, philosophy never arose in a pure form. And then there was no monotheism in the in the East. So there was no uh, there were no Jews in the East to spread a monotheistic religion. So they grew up with many gods. So they had no real philosophers and they had no real monotheistic religion. So they got a mishmash of both. Uh, and but but you have to have something. And every civilization anyway, even the most primitive hunter gatherers have some system of belief to explain the world around. them. Right. That that all makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so by the same argument, then though, and I know you got to wrap up here, so we'll, yep. we'll close it up. You couldn't necessarily, I don't think, get to objectivism then without Christianity, because Christianity led to the Pro- Pro- Protestant Reformation, which led to the Industrial Revolution, which led to you know giving someone like Ayn Rand the leisure time to even formulate something like objectivism. Sure. So yeah, but is the question it- is. The question is, what would have happened without Christianity? So you could make the argument. Um, I could make the argument. It would be fun, right, to have an alternative history where there's no Christianity, where Rome is not is not undermined by Christianity, because I think Christianity undermines Rome, and where maybe we get an industrial revolution a thousand years earlier. Um, I would say Christianity probably delayed the industrial revolution, didn't support it. The mm. Renaissance was a renaissance of Greek thought a renaissance of Greek art. Mm. So what allowed for reformation and uh, and really an enlightenment was the renaissance and the renaissance is Greece. So I would argue that as long as we have Greece, we have the seeds of capitalism, industrial revolution and all of that. And uh, Christianity delays because it's anti-Greece. Um, mm. It delays the impact of Greece. But that, you know, that's, that's a whole... Fun to speculate, right? We can't. Yeah, we could never know, obviously. Um, no, but we could, it's an interesting. It's an interesting debate, right? Yes. And and certainly, once you have Aristotle, you have most of what you need to have everything that we have today. Gotcha. So, last question. I think I may have asked you a version of this before, though. If Rand is proposing something that you know upends, or, or what did you say, distills down to the essence of what we need in an ethical, yep. moral framework, isn't this kind of the up ultimate uphill battle though? Because she's like, hey, all that Christianity stuff that runs the world, you billions of people, 
disregard all that. Just focus on this writing here. I mean, it seems it's, damn near impossible. It seems damn near impossible. That's my job, though. It's <laughs> the damn near impossible. And, it, you know, so, yes, it's very, it's very difficult. The flip side of that is we have reason and happiness on our side. That's pretty powerful. Mm. Great place to put a button on it. Sounds Mr. Brooke, good. thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. Always fun. Thanks.